Um, so we have started in a series called Peculiar People, and we just kind of dove into this last week, and this week we're going to start part two of that. And we're going to dive right in because we've got some stuff to get into, and um, really just to unpack a lot of, of, of who we are. In Proverbs 3, 1 through 12, it says this, Good friend, don't forget all I've taught you. Take to heart my commands. They'll keep you, or they'll help you live a long, long time, a long life, lived full and well. Come on. Don't lose your grip on love and loyalty. Tie them around your neck. Carve their initials on your heart. Earn a reputation for living well in the eyes of God and in the eyes of people. Isn't that weird sometimes that us as Christians will try to live all good for, for Jesus and we'll try to live all good for God, but then when it comes to actually being involved in actual people's lives, it seems like the opposite is true, that you don't follow Jesus and that you, you can be mean about things. Our job is to live good in the eyes of God and in the eyes of people. Five says, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure everything out on your own. Lord, I wish my kids could just understand this. Jesus. You know what, that's sad, but it's the exact same thing that Jesus thinks about us, God thinks about us. Like, like I wrote it down for you. Like, yeah. like, this is supposed to be on your heart. Like, do this. And I'm like, yeah, my kids, I wish. And I'm like, oh yeah, cool, okay. Um, listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. See, now I got real convicted at that point because um. I feel like I may know a lot of things. That's a nice way to say that. I feel as if I'm the expert in a lot of areas. Um, that is just so not true. Okay, run to God, run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Come on. Real life. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst and your wine vats will brim over. Woo! Come on, ladies. That's what I'm saying. Don't pretend that you don't. You. But don't, dear friend, resent God's discipline. Don't sulk under his loving correction. It is the child he loves that God corrects. It's the father's delight behind this the whole time. See, when I go to correct my kid, Right? I don't want to do it because I'm like, he's doing the wrong thing. Like, this is totally wrong. And I want to come at him and, and put him right. Anytime that you try to correct someone by putting them right, it's never going to have the outcome you want. Our job is to lead them to the correct answer. So if you're coming across harsh to your children, or you're coming across just not at all, and you're like, ah, it's no big deal. Like, our job is to say that it's not right. Just how God disciplines us when we're not doing something right, he's like, hey, hey, hey. Go this way just a little bit. Like, hey, you remember when you were talking to that person and you came across a little bit harsh? Like, you should probably go apologize for that. And it's like, oh yeah. Not, because here's what most people think is like, oh, you sinned. God got you, ooh. Like, you better go pray right now. You better pray before the rapture happens. Right? I mean, honestly, that's what people are thinking. But when God disciplines, it's the same way that we want to discipline our kids. We want to move them into truth, right? That's what we, where we want to go with this. Second Corinthians 10, uh, 8, 10 through 20 says this. So here's what I think. The best thing you can do right now is to finish what you started last year and not let those good intentions grow stale. Your heart's been in the right place all along. You've got what it takes to finish it up, so go do it. Once the commitment is clear, you do what you can, not what you can't. That right there is going to set a lot of people free today. Because we want to do everything for everyone else. We want to try to fix this. We want to show them how this works. We want to do this. Like, our job is to do what we can do, not what we can. Use the tools that you already have, you already have inside of you, and then say, hey, I need help with this. Don't do things you can't. And you want to know why you shouldn't do things you can't? Listen, I'm not... Um, I'm not very good at car stuff at all, really. And uh, so I had something break on, on my Jeep, and I was like, dude, I'm totally gonna fix this. It's not gonna be that big of a deal. And uh, I had a guy that came into the church, and he was like, hey, man, you know what? I'll kind of like, I'll, I'll oversee you and like help you out, you know? So like we like go to take, uh, we're like changing the water pump on my Jeep, and I'm like, like, 
looking on YouTube, like, while he's like, oh, yeah, just get that piece out, get the combobulator, flip it till it is, man. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, hold on real quick, buddy. Uh, yep, got that. Some of you are, like, dinking on a, on a, you know, this engine, like, trying to figure out how to get this thing off. The thing about it is I, I don't know how to do that. I was trying to do what I couldn't. And here's the thing. Not only do you feel inadequate when that happens, everyone else knows that you can't do it. Yeah. For real, any time that I try to walk, like, I, man, you know what? I love to sing, right? If I stood up here and was like, I'm, we about to sing a special, like I'm gonna do what Pastor Rod does, and he's like, y'all listen to this song, it's just in my heart. And I started to play that piano, it would literally not sound like music, and out of that microphone would come screeches of dying cats. <laughs> you would know, but I felt it. It's what I feel, it was good. I'm gonna do what I can do, not what I can. Listen, do you guys have weird friends? Like just weird friends, like you know that they're weird. And here's the thing, if you don't have, like if you don't know who they are, um, you're probably that one. So, uh, you know, perspective. <laughs> We're all weird. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about one of my friends who is just like one of the most weird humans on earth. Um, and it really like, I, I love this story because it, it makes me feel so happy of how weird and how awkward it is. And like, I just, I love it. So here we are, we're, we're at church. Um, my father-in-law was preaching at our church in Florida and he's, you know, talking after it, getting after it. And I'm in the back of the church. Like I'm all the way in, like we have this little media room and I'm like pressing buttons and like calling cameras and all this stuff is kind of just going on. So I'm not paying attention to anything that's really going on other than get to this camera, get to this next shot, do this next thing. So I hear like ushers in the back kind of chatting. And they're like, there's a guy in there. He's blah, blah, blah. He busted in the door. Well, come to find out there was a guy that had walked in through a front door of the auditorium. Now, when, when we say front door, like not a front door, right? Like front door would be like where that speaker is, right? And the dude walks in like this. Not like, you know, normally you like walk into a door, like services started. You know what's happening, right? And you're like, like, and you peek. You're like, oh, yep, wrong door. No, not this guy. He said, one, two, three doors. Eh, they covered, it looks like, bow! Walks through, bongo in hand, sits on the front row, and he's just right there, just sitting there. Like nothing, like nothing just happened. Like that, it did not happen that he just kicked in that door, sat on the front row, has a bongo and a backpack, and is looking like he's been living in the woods for months. So he, Alan is just, I mean, he's holding his stuff together, right? He's uh, going out, doing the notes. All that. Alan will say a verse, and he'll go, say it again, pastor! <laughs> Alan's like, so in Psalms 3, <laughs> like, just like, okay, bro. There's a screen that has, like, it's a big, giant Bible. Look at it. So he's holding his stuff all together, and the, 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 uh, the, all the people that are in the back are like, we're gonna have to tackle this guy. He might be coming here to have a bomb or all something crazy. And so like, I'm like, I'm like hearing all this chatter and I just walk out of the back of the, the, the place and I see what's going on. I was like, oh, hey, hey, Chris, what's up, bro? Yeah, dude, man, what's up? How you been? How's it? This dude, like, they, like, I mean, like people are up in arms. Like, I'm gonna tackle this dude. Like they were like, like, hey, I'm packing. Like, just, you tell me. He's go now, he did look real crazy. I understand that. So having weird friends, being weird is normal. And honestly, to put the icing on the cake, I, just, I have to throw this in here because this is just so great. Um, I haven't seen the student forever. And he was like, whoa. And everyone's like, oh my gosh. And then he's like, let's go out to eat. Where are you going? He's like, we're going to eat with you, bro. Where are we going? So like normal people, they walk out to their car, they open the door, they get in, correct? Of course this dude could not do that. He's got some hoopty station wagon, just the window opens up, he takes his backpack and his bongo and throws it in and then just dives in the back of his car. <laughs> he gets in and I'm like, what you got? The door's broke. Like, at figures, I get that. Being weird is okay. Like I know that, that, I know he's weird. I know that that is totally insane, but weirdness doesn't have to define us. Like, you get to be your own weird. Like, 
I'm, I'm a pretty weird dude. I'll be real honest. Like, I like weird things. Like, whenever my kids are like, they're like staring out the window. Like, yesterday, we're like helping Legend with some homework and stuff. And he's looking out there. And I was like, hey, buddy, what are you daydreaming about? And he's like, nothing. I was like, do you see like alien squirrels fighting like giant octopuses? And he's like, no. <laughs> But could you? So I get it that you're weird, but our weirdness is what God has given us to be us. Like you have something inside of you, your uniqueness, your weirdness, whatever you want to call it, makes you who you are. And you're going to attract that in other people. I'll give you a real rule of attraction. I didn't believe that it was true, like how really true this was. Um, until last night on our way to dinner, we were stuck in traffic. And in traffic, like we're just sitting there, right, at a stoplight forever. Like one of these lights where you're like, like the actual rapture is gonna happen before we get out of here. And so I'm just like staring forward, like, oh my goodness, please. And all of a sudden, Lori goes, Seth, please look over here. So I'm sitting there and I look over and I look at the car next to me and there is a 27 or 28 year old dude going like this out of his car going, I promise you. So I'm weird enough, so my response is, I'm part of the little rascals too. <laughs> and, then, and then it went, what? <laughs> then, then it happened, it happened even further than that. So it went from the kind of, you know, little rascals welcome to all of a sudden he was like giving me hearts and I was being Cupid and shooting it. Um, <laughs> And then, like, to top it all off, like, we're, we're, like, laughing. I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, this is actually hilarious. Like, I think this is the greatest. And Lori's like this, like, not looking, like, nope, nope, nope. And, like, Abby's in the back. And I'm like, Abby, I was like, isn't this hilarious? And she's like, no. Why, are, why is this happening? So the dude's like, like, roll down your window. And Lori, Lori's, like, reaching for a window, like, mm, -mm not going to happen. I was like, Hey, what's up, bro? Hey, what are you doing? He's like, you know that made your day. You know it made your day, didn't it? He's like, you want to switch cars? Things got real weird real fast. I don't, uh, yeah. After that, it was like, okay, you know, that, that's cool. Please, God. But don't worry, because the light still didn't change. I'm very serious. All of that happened, like, way after we stopped and way before we left. So you're gonna attract people who you are. But that's a gift that you have. Now, now that was a very, very particular and odd situation, but you're gonna attract people like that. Everywhere I go, people that look like me, people that dress like me, people that act like me, they're attracted to you because people wanna belong a part of something. See, the Bible says, listen here in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says each person is gives something to do who shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it and everyone benefits. So why do we try to, want, try to want to cut ourselves out of being as weird as we are? What if that's your gift to reach those people? What if it's your time to go reach the people that are very, like they dress very, very nice and have ties and they, you know, they work the corporate job. Like what if that is your people that you're supposed to be going after, but instead you're trying to be like something else? See, for a long time, I struggled with wanting to try to fit in. Right, like I wanted to like, you know, I wanted to be like my big brother. He dressed really nice. He always like had the Michael Jordan cologne. Um, you know, uh, there were no girls involved with that. I don't know, that just wasn't, you know, just Michael Jordan clone in middle school was the jam. So I was like, dude, that's all I wanna have. And then it just got to a tipping point. It's like, am I gonna be who I wanna be or am I gonna try to be my brother? Now, I, I tried it for a while. I did the frosted tips and everything, my bros. Like the forward, Frost the tips, it was a total nightmare. So then I just went in the total opposite direction and started to grow my hair out really long and dye it bright blue. So I wore just the craziest outfits you've ever seen in life. Like, and I don't know why I did that other than it was, a, it was an expression of who I was. I was pierced, I wanted tattoos, I wanted to, you know, just, I wanted to be who I thought I was gonna be. So because of that, because of me saying yes to me, and because you get to say yes to being you, you're gonna impact those people along the way. See, when we, had, when we had our youth program in Florida, nobody looked like they were going to church. Like literally our church people's kids that went, they would say like, hey, I don't really want them coming to youth group. I was like, 
what are you talking about? Like, well, they don't look like church people. Like, they don't look like church. They're serving in the church the whole time. They set up everything. They run your cameras. They play in your band, but you don't want your kid to hang out with them because they look different. So our job, our main job, is to be who we were called to be. Let your weirdness flow. It's okay. So let me talk about this. I'm going to talk about weird for a second. Weird, the definition of weird, right? And I, I was kind of blown away when I started reading this, is that weird equals suggesting something is supernatural. Well, I want to be weird. Like before I wanted to be different and just like try things on and be weird and all that stuff, but like I, I do want to be weird. If that's the definition that I get to be supernatural, I want to walk in that. I want to be a part of that. Because when I'm talking to people, I want to hear from God for their situation. I don't want to just say like, oh man, I'm sorry you're going through that. Have a great day. Like, I want to walk to that situation and God has already told me, hey, they are dealing with major depression. You are going to have a word for depression for them. All I need you to do is to speak. It's like, yes, sir. So if you ask those things, God's going to prepare you to be able to reach those people. Man, oh, I love it. Um, Proverbs 3, 7 says this, is that uh, don't assume that you know it all. Don't assume that you know what everybody's going through. Don't assume that you know the things that you think that you're supposed to know about someone. Well, I'm gonna change them. Like, I know they're not supposed to be doing that. They're, they're in with this, and I know that that's not right. I remember growing up like this all the time. With, you know, like, you can't listen to those CDs. You can't listen to that music. You can't do this. We can't let who we are affect other people that way. Let them be them, let them take care of themselves, and let you be you. Because you're gonna find freedom in that where you're not having to try to micromanage everybody that comes around you, and I promise those people are gonna be way more happy with you not talking. Hmm. See, we can't force our weirdness on others either. See, as a, as a Christian, you're gonna come across as, as maybe being weird, that we gather in a place where they can't see God and they don't know what happens in this place and that's weird. And we sing songs to someone that died thousands of years ago, they think, and we read from ancient texts. But we know the difference. So our job is not to force them to see it our way. Our job is to lead them this way. See, I wanna tell you two, two categories of change. There are things that I can change and there's things that God can change, okay? 2 Corinthians 8.12, reminder, says, do what you can, not what you can. Here's the things that I can change, myself, okay? Things that God can change, everybody else. Now, God can use you to change people, but true change is coming from the Holy Spirit. Not because you don't like something about someone. Not because you wanna set them right. Not because they said something that made your sister mad, that got your dog walker's best friend's cousins mad, and now you're gonna set them right. That's not how that works. Your job is to pray for them. That's your job, and to take care of your own business. See, I, Seth, cannot save anyone. I can't save anyone. I can't force people to repent and, and become part of the church. I can't force them to change because real change is gonna come from the Holy Spirit, not Seth. See, now we can ask God to use us we can ask God to send us to people or have people sent to us, but real change comes from the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 21 through 24 says, since you have heard about Jesus, remember that, since you have heard about Jesus and have turned the truth, turned, uh, learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your formal way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on a new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So what part of us trying to change people has anything to do with that verse? If we want people to actually be changed, we don't have a part in that other than that first line that says, since you have heard about Jesus, our job is to bring Jesus to people. It's almost like Jesus rose from the dead to tell the disciples that. Our job is to go to those people, to reach those people, and if you're reaching the people that are like you, they're gonna become attached to you so you have influence on their lives. And the Holy Spirit is gonna give you words to say when you don't know what to say. 
So many times I've walked into situations where I'm like, hey, you know, this isn't a big deal. Like, I'll, you know, you're just like trying to figure out what is going on. Like, they're falling apart and you're like, oh, no. Like, when emotional stuff happens, like, my mind is just like, like, in this, like, giant limbo. And I have to remind myself, this is crazy. I have to remind myself, like, I need the Holy Spirit right now. I need you to speak to me because they need something that I can't give them. True change comes from the Holy Spirit. I made a list. Here's that list. Uh, here's a list of things that you can change. This is really a list for me because I was, I'm kind of a butthead. Um, list of things you can change. My attitude. My actions my responsibilities, and my reactions. Those are things that I get to change. Those are things that I have a say over, that I say, God, change this in me. I need this to be changed. Now, here's a list of things that, that God changes. Other people's attitudes, other people's actions, other people's responsibilities, and other people's reactions. Our job is not to change people our job is to lead them to truth. That's all we are called to do. When we bring Jesus, we're showing them what truth is. We're showing them how it's really like to be a disciple, what it's really like to follow Jesus. Not a church, not a building. That's great that we get to come here and have fun, but our job is to be the good Christian whatever at your actual job. Because for so many people, it leaves here, and I've, I was guilty of this for a real long time, like doing the church thing and then going out and being an idiot for the other six days. And I come to church, and I'm like, yeah, God, I need you. And the other six days, I'm like, yeah, whatever. I mean, you're fake or something. I don't know. So our job is to bring truth to people. Learning that you can't change people will give you the freedom to be you and will let God be God. That's a good truth to learn, to, to actually be yourself instead of trying to be something that you're not. Once again, do what you can, not what you can't. Yes. Everyone's going to know that you're faking it. You ever, I mean, middle school, like this is the word, right? Like if you're, if you're like 30-ish, the word was poser. Like that was the word. Like the dude that would come to school in his etni skate shoes and like had all the sweet like ragged out skate gear and like he's never actually ridden a skateboard. You're like, poser. <laughs> it's like someone's posing as something else, yeah. Um, so our job, our job is to be ourselves. Our job is to be who you are called to be. That, mean, that can mean clothing, that can mean humor, that can mean following Jesus, that can mean so many different things. But if we are not us, then we're gonna try to be something that we're not. And here's, here's re two reasons that you need to be you. You ready for this? The number one reason to be, uh, that you need to be yourself is to reach people. You being yourself is gonna put you in the position to reach people that other people are never gonna reach. Just because you're yourself. But if you're trying to act like something that you're not, you're not gonna get what you wanted. God has ordained meetings for you and you specifically. You have the ability to reach people that no one would ever reach just by being you, and that, that is a responsibility of following Jesus. Because if we're supposed to go into the world baptizing people and telling about the good news of people and we're deciding not to do that, then we're saying no to the resurrection. We're saying no to Jesus. Our job, now, sharing Jesus, I don't mean you're standing on a street corner. I don't mean that you're like blasting Facebook or Instagram or whatever you're on, being Jesus to someone could actually mean just be nice to them. Smile. I mean, I've seen a lot of grumpy people in my life and they need way more Jesus than what they got. Lord. You know, most of the time, the way that God is gonna work is gonna be sending us to people. Remember that whole conversation you had where he said that we're gonna go into all the world? That's our job and let God use us and stretch us in some ways that may feel weird. It's really weird talking to someone at a gas station. I mean, honestly, have you ever tried to do it? It's super weird. Everyone wants to pull up, get out of their car, put the card in, press the buttons, put the gas in the tank, stare at the numbers like you're not actually trying to talk to them, finish that, get the receipt, get up, put it in, get away. Try having a conversation at a gas, gas station. 
I had one the other day, and it went really, really good for the first time in a real long time. And I have no idea how I did it or what happened, but I was happy that I said hey, he was happy that I said hey, and we just went our separate ways. It was great. But most of the time, it's like, hey, man, how are you? Ding, 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 ding. Okay, well, I'll go now. Goodbye. It may feel weird to be used by God sometimes. You may do things that aren't considered normal, and that's okay, because you're supposed to be yourself, not be normal. Oh, man. According to Thomas Rainier, 65% of churches in America are in decline or have plateaued. The most current Huntsville, Decatur, Albertville combined statistical area shows that 441,000 people live up here. In 2015, 49% of people surveyed, according to Pew Research, said they don't go to church or rarely attend religious services. That means that 216,090 people rarely attend or go to church that we interact with all the time. That's just here. Our job is to meet those people at the gas stations. Our job is to listen to the Holy Spirit when he says, no, 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 go to the other checkout lane. Our job is to listen to Holy Spirit when your mom is calling and you don't answer. Hey, answer the call. hey yo, Right, Lori? <clears throat> oh, I love it. We have to stop letting excuses get in the way to be able to reach people outside of these walls. We got to give it up. It's not because you're shy. It's not because, you know, uh, you're at the fear of speaking to people. It's not because you don't have enough money. It's because you, it's hard to say yes to things that feel awkward. Mother Teresa, who we've all known, and we know Mother Teresa, um, had uh, started a, a ministry called uh, Mother Teresa Missionary of Charity. It consists of 4,500 sisters and is, and is active in 133 countries around the world. They run hospices and homes for people with HIV and AIDS, leprosy, tuberculosis, soup kitchens, children's and family counseling programs, orphanages and schools. And members of this order must adhere to vows of chastity, poverty, obedience. And the fourth is to give wholehearted and free service to the poorest of the poor. Before starting this charity, one of her haters asked her how she was going to start, start the mission, and she, she said that she had three pennies. They replied, you can't build an orphanage with three pennies. With three pennies, you can't do anything. Mother Teresa just smiled and replied, I know, but with God and three pennies, I can do anything. When you let your inadequacies build up on top of each other, it's still enough. When you let your shame build up on top of you and you say, I don't know if I can do that because, you know, I did da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, that's not enough. Our job is to say yes to that. If Mother Teresa with three pennies can build that, like, I, I have more than three pennies. I should be listening to what God wants me to do in my life. It's easy to take those steps, but it's gonna feel weird, and weird is Okay. It may be trying. You may not know where the finances are going to come from, or you're not knowing that I don't know how to speak in front of people, or I don't know how to teach people, or I don't know how to train people, or I don't even know how to smile in public yet. But we have someone that wants to change our hearts. See, when we have problems and we bring them to Jesus, like, like I love this analogy that we're bringing this really gross, nasty present to Jesus, and then when Jesus sees this, he's happy that you're bringing it, and then he rewards and rewraps that specifically for you. See, when we bring junk, he's excited about it. Somebody brought me junk, I'd be like, yeah, thanks, that's cool, I'm gonna throw it away. See, when, when heart change happens, our whole lives can be turned around. Um, we gotta reach people by any means necessary. We have to reach the abused. We have to reach the battered, the hurt, the sick, and the mentally ill. Because the Holy Spirit could use us to be the catalyst for someone's heart change. In light of recent events at Stoneman Douglas High School, have shown that we have to reach everyone. It doesn't matter that if you're with the left, or the right, or pro-gun, or anti-gun, we can all agree that everyone needs more Jesus. See, I don't want to be the person that didn't want to go listen to the Holy Spirit and talk to that person 
when I could be the catalyst for that change through the Holy Spirit. That kid missed something somewhere. I don't want to miss people when they're hurting. I don't want to miss people when they're sad or upset or depressed or have anxiety or have guilt beyond belief or have torn apart their marriage or have no idea what's going on in their life because I think it's weird or awkward. We get to let the Holy Spirit use us to change the face of this planet. I don't want 49% of people being Christmas and Easter only Christians or not coming at all. I want them to be in this building or in another church being loved on and shown that there's hope and there's a way and they're going to have a bright future instead of saying, you know what? It's weird if I talk to them in Walgreens, I don't know. It's hard to say yes to certain things, I get it, but our job is to reach people us reaching people stops bad things from happening. The only thing that's going to stop those things is that everyone is going to get more Jesus. That's it. I wish I could say it was less guns, more guns. We need to go this way and have teachers have guns or everyone needs to be on anxiety medication that has a problem. Like, I don't know what the answer is, but what I do know is that more people need Jesus. And if we'll reach those people before it gets to that point, we'll never deal with issues like this. And that's a real hard reality because we have missed a lot of people, myself included in that. I'm not saying you. I'm saying me and saying it's weird. I don't know. We have a responsibility to reach people. One day an old man was sitting along the beach that was littered with thousands of starfish that could have been washed ashore by the high tide. As he walked, he came upon a young boy who was eagerly throwing starfish back into the ocean one by one. Puzzled, the man looked at the boy and asked what he was doing. Without looking up from his task, the boy simply replied, I'm saving these starfish, sir. The old man chuckled out loud, Son, there are thousands of starfish, and there's only one of you. What difference can you make? The boy picked up the starfish and gently tossed it into the water, turning to the man and said, I made a difference in that one. See, when people, just like these starfish, are washed up on the shore, they felt used and abused and battered and torn. It's our job to say that one and give them hope. Let the Holy Spirit use you to pick them up, to be their friend, to show them that people do still smile. That's our responsibility when we're following Jesus. So the number one reason you to be you is because we have people to reach. Number two is to live a fulfilled life. When you start being yourself, you get such a just rush of who you are. And I know that sounds like you're like building yourself up or you're like, like I'm so full of myself. Like, no, 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 no. When you walk in your calling, it's just like if if you have kids and you see them do something that they are absolutely awesome at. Like, it's like, yes, like you were born for this. Like our son Legend, like I love this guy to death. And he is literally... He's probably the most generous person that I know. Like, our family is a pretty generous people, but this kid wants to give all of it away. If he knows that one of his friends needs something, it's his, it's theirs. Like, watching that happen is like, you watch that, like God created the the, the dreams inside of you, right? So we want legend to, to become more Uh, more generous in his life. So when that happens, like we put generosity in, then we watch generosity grow. It's the same with God. Like when you were born, God put dreams and ideas and things inside of you. And when you start to, to grow in those things, like you become more fulfilled and then you have a sense of calling on your life. So you're not having to wonder, am I supposed to do this? Is this the way that I should go? And am, am I following who God created me to be? Like you have a sense of purpose that's from God. So ask him. We get to ask those questions, and it's just like my son. If you were to come to me or, or my daughter come to me and ask me, what do you want me to do, Daddy? I'm not going to say, figure it out. No. I'm going to speak to them on their level. I'm going to say, hey, baby, I love you. Let's go this way. This is the way that we need to go. We don't want you to go out by the road. We need to walk on the sidewalk. 
that's the way when we talk with God, when we find that, that what we want to do with life that God has given us, it gives us that purpose. And just like in that verse, it said that, that God is going to draw that, that, that path for us. That's the way that we get to do this. Do the things that you can, not the things you can't. Just remember, when you're doing the things that you can, you're going to feel validated and alive and just a sense of just urgency for life. When you're doing the things that you can't, everyone else knows too. Being and acting true to who God made you is saying yes to holiness, saying yes to the gifts he has handed to you, saying yes to your calling and yes to writing or rewriting your story. Psalms 118, five through nine says this, push to the wall, I called out to God. From the wide open spaces, he answered. God is now at my side and I'm not afraid. Who would dare lay a hand on me? God is my strong champion. I flick off enemies like flies. Far better to take refuge in God than trust in people. Far better to take refuge in God than trust in celebrities. Anytime we put our trust in celebrities over God or people over God, you will always feel lack. You will never feel good enough. See, I love, I love Facebook and I love Instagram. I mean, there's so many crazy things on there. Um, but the downside of that is, is that it magnifies a sense that you aren't accomplishing enough. It magnifies the sense that you aren't rich enough, that you don't do crazy adventures enough, and you definitely can't cook good enough. The sooner you quit playing the comparison game, the sooner you'll be able to follow your dreams. God has placed big dreams inside of you that only you can fulfill. See, he has a spot that was built especially for Mike. And that spot is where Mike sits, and then Mike gets to do the things that Mike was called to do. If we try to do it the way, you know, Seth was doing it and Mike's trying to fit into Seth's mold or Seth's trying to fit into Mike's mold, we're not gonna have the same big dreams that we thought. We'll sit there empty-handed and think, what went wrong? Why, why did this not work? Didn't have enough money or didn't do this. God has placed dreams inside of all of us that we are still called to. I don't care, age is, is not a thing about dreams at all. It is all about what God has placed in you, and if you say yes to the call, you're going to find more fulfillment in that. Our job is to take our future and our dreams and hand them back to God. See, when you're frustrated and you're wondering what's going on and why is this not working, he's sitting there saying, come on, like, gimme, gimme, gimme. Let me see it. I know how to change this. I know how to help fix this. All you have to do is listen to me. See, a bow in my hands might be able to kill a deer, maybe. On, on a very, very good day and the wind's not blowing and I'm literally standing right next to it. <laughs> See, a bow in Robin Hood's, can, uh, Robin Hood's hands can set captives free. A basketball in my hands is worth about $19. A basketball in Steph Curry's hands is worth about $40 million. Football in my hands is worth about 20 bucks. Football in Tom Brady's hands is worth about 20 million. A rod in my hand can keep a wild animal away rod in Moses' hand could part the mighty seas. A slingshot in my hands is a kid's toy, and a slingshot in David's hands is a giant slayer. Two fish and five loaves of bread in my hands is a, is a couple of fish sandwiches. Two fish and five loaves of bread in God's hands will feed thousands. Nails in my hands might be able to produce a birdhouse, but nails in Jesus' hands will produce salvation for the entire world. You see, it depends on whose hands you put your dream in. If it tries to go to celebrities or to people like that says, you're always gonna fall short of that. You're always gonna fall in lack of that. But when we place it back to God and we say like, God, I don't even know how to do this. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know how to accomplish these things. See, and I'll tell you what that was. I saw myself on a stage preaching long before I was even okay to stand up in front of people to talk. I had dreams. I saw myself on a stage with blue lights behind me, not this stage, and I was speaking to a ton of kids. And I was like, that is super weird because I wouldn't stand up in front of a bunch of people, I would be loud and crazy and wild and obnoxious, but to actually communicate something for real, it wouldn't happen. 
So I held on to that dream and tried to follow that dream because if God gives it to you, you don't see how those pieces are gonna play out. I didn't know that, you know, we were gonna leave one church and then my mom and dad were gonna go find this church and then I was gonna be a part of this family and Rod was gonna be there and Alan was gonna be the pastor and they would disciple me and shape me into who I am and then I'd marry his daughter and I would do all these things to be able to set me up to be able to go to Africa to preach, to see that thing actually happen in real life. I couldn't have planned it if I wanted to. It's not your job to plan it. Our job is to say yes. Holy Spirit, use me. I want to be at the end of my life to leave a legacy of saying I followed the Holy Spirit in everything that I did instead of saying I wish I would have listened more. I want to follow after that. I want to say yes to Jesus more. I want to do what I can do, not what I can't. You have to do what you can do. I can only do what I can do. But we are going to reach people and live fulfilled lives because those are promises to us. Father, we worship you. God, we glorify you. Father, that right now our, our hearts may feel weird because we feel like we're not going after our passions and we're not following our dreams, but just like, just like it says in Proverbs, it says that, that uh, we're not gonna sulk under his loving correction and resent God's discipline. Father, we're asking that you change our hearts. Father, if we're not following your passions, we're not saying yes to you enough, God, we repent of that. Father, I wanna change my heart. I wanna reach people. I wanna, I wanna see people healed. I want people's marriages to be restored. I want people's lives to feel better. I want anxiety and depression and mental illness gone because they have more of you. Holy Spirit, use me, use us to impact the world. And today, if you've never made a decision for Christ, we wanna pray a, a simple prayer with you. And we say this as a church, and church, you'll repeat this after me. We say, thank you, Jesus, that you died on a cross, that you loved us, and you're my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made that commitment today, we have some stuff out in the VIP room for you. Listen, we have good things ahead of us. We're going to do what we can, not what we can't. We're gonna reach people. We're gonna love on people real hard. And loving on people sometimes is super awkward because they're mad at you or upset at you. We have to be the hands and feet of Jesus to people.